Hello amateurs and welcome back to the channel. Going to be here with you through to the end of the season. So hit subscribe to make sure you don't miss out on any future episodes. But this one is all about week 15 of the Premiership. Getting towards the end now, just four games to go before this weekend's fixtures. And it's a time where things get really critical. A defeat can mean you're out of the picture altogether. And bonus points can be a really, really big thing. So with eight out of the 10 teams still in with a chance of semi-final qualification, let's get through these games for this week. First up was Saracens, who are in third against Gloucester in ninth. I predicted a big win for Saracens. I hadn't even bothered looking at the Gloucester team because I didn't think it was that relevant. Well, it kind of was and wasn't because Gloucester essentially picked a second string with George Skivington saying all things about squad rotation and freshness with a challenge semi-final coming up. You know, I mean, what do you think about it? Should teams be forced to play their strongest team or are they allowed to rotate their squads? Because again, towards this end of the season, it can make a massive difference to how teams progress. In any case, it was Gloucester twos and they did put up a bit of a fight, really, at the start. Uh, there were some good hits going in, but essentially they were they were completely outclassed. And Tom Parton, the former London Irish uh, fullback, but playing on the wing in this game, scored the earliest ever hat trick uh, in Premiership history. Uh, by the 20 minutes and 25 seconds mark, he'd already got his third try. So when he was at London Irish, you know, in that huge gathering of back uh, back three talent they amassed there, I always liked Parton. He just seems a little bit. Uh, under the radar, but always, always performed well. That meant it was 22-0 at half-time, and really the game was the game was dead. Uh, and then early in the second half, Saracens used what is essentially a cheat code, where they did a crossfield kick to Theo McFarlane, who is so good in the air and catching the ball above his head. But it doesn't really matter who he's up against. He's always going to win it. He did, in this case, sprinted through 27-0. Willis, uh, Tom Willis, who was picked over... Billy Bonapola, which is a bit of a surprise. Bonapola has always been favoured at Saracens, so it's interesting to see when his time coming towards an end, you know, whether he's going to go out with a bang or whether he might just fizzle off, you know, we'll see. But that made it 32 0. And um, Gloucester actually came back after a bit of, um, well, first phase play where they got smashed backwards. There were some lovely hands and then a beautiful kick from reserve hooker Seb Blake, which gave Josh Hathaway. His first try of the game. However, normal service resumed pretty soon afterwards uh, as Hartley and then Cinti went over. That made it 46 5. And if Gloucester had earned that first try, they still certainly didn't earn the second or third. Where first Gareth Simpson, who managed to pass it over the head of Ollie Hartley, which is some doing. Ollie Hartley's a big guy. And then Ollie Hartley himself both passed essentially directly to Hadaway to run the ball in for his hat trick in 46 17. So really late in the game now, and, and Gloucester did actually earn the fourth try as well, with Seth Blake getting in on the sticks for 46-24. I predicted Sarries by lots, and if it wasn't for that, you know, that absolute catastrophe, as far as Saracens are concerned by the end, it could have been a whole lot more. To be honest, the scoreline of 46-24 flattered Gloucester. Sarries marching on, not looking ominous, but, you know, it's a decent performance from them. On to the next game, and we've got Northampton in one against Leicester, who was seventh at the start of the day, desperately in need of a win to really push their semi-final chances. Saints picked a little bit of a second string, especially in the backs, moving further back to uh, fly half and giving Oli Slytome a rest and Courtney Laws a rest. And I thought this was going to be really tight with potentially Leicester nicking it, and it did go that way um, for the vast majority of this game. Dan Cole, which should get a mention, it's his 235th league game for Leicester Tigers, which is setting a new club record held by, uh, formerly held, I should say, by fellow prop Graham Roundtree. And they had a proper old school Leicester start to this game as they drove a line out over from Antoya to score in 7 0. A couple of pens for Saints and then one by Tigers. And then followed a very different Booker's drive where Curtis Langdon, with absolute wheels, uh, sprinted clear, caused uh, JVP uh, to miss his tackle, and it was 11-10, Saints ahead, but very, very tight. Alex Mitchell into the second half, being an absolute live wire, as he is, around the base of the scrum, causing all kinds of problems, and a quick pass from him forced Shilcock to knock the ball on, or deliberately knock the ball on, it was decided 
which led to a penalty try and a yellow card, 18-10, and it felt like the tide had turned. But with only 30 seconds left on the uh, on the Simbi, Tigers managed to get a foothold five metres from Saints line, which led to Visa on the back peel. And he did a really smart thing, actually. He ran directly at where the ref was, which got off both Hendy and Furbank, neither of which were probably going to make the tackle anyway, but it looked like a little bit of a schoolboy try as, as he powered over. 18-17, 60 minutes on the clock, and it was looking very nip and tuck at this stage. Uh, really could have gone either way until Solomon Akata rushed up, smashed the wall, stood up, and, um, and that was a red card for him. These are the type of ones that we're trying to get out of the game. And to be honest, you don't see them all that much anymore, really, compared to how many they used to be. Uh, interestingly, it was uh, Fraser Dingwall, like I said, that he hit. Dingwall was actually first up and seemed to ask Kata if he was okay, which is very... I imagine that's very much like Fraser Dingwall. It seems like a very decent chap. Anyway, Kata off. Uh, Saints then dominated, really, the rest of the game. The line-out try for a, a try by uh, reserve hooker Robbie Smith. And then off the bench, Finn Smith and Tommy Freeman, two absolute worldies to come on, and they created a try for George Hendy, the bonus point try at 32-17. Then the Saints went the leg from a turnover, uh, Tigers trying to get desperately trying to get back in the game. Freeman kicked on. Phil Coppin, the singer, made an error, and Tom James was over for the try. And towards the end, Finn Smith dropped a goal for 40 points to 17 and the joint biggest ever East Midlands derby win for Northampton. What a win that absolutely cements them at the top of the table. And with three games to go, I mean, I think they're pretty much there in terms of a semi final. One more win might get them a home semi final. But that was a great day for Saints. Into the late game on Saturday, we've got Exeter, who was sixth, versus Bath in second. Bath missing uh, Finn Russell and Cam Redpath. And I wondered whether that would really unst- unsteady them. It was, it was not quite sure. Exeter off a big loss last week in the European Cup. And it looked like this was a real KG affair. Uh, not, not after 25 minutes, you know, it kind of suggests that neither team's really hitting their flow. And but Bart scored a line-out drive after a brilliant kick ahead from tight head Will Stewart and a funny old bounce. Uh, Barbara getting the, the, the uh, touchdown there. The Chiefs came back. Uh, Aaron Painter, after belly flopping on one rock and nearly killing the man, uh, then took out Tom Dunn at a couple of rocks further on when he literally walked around the side of the rock, saw Tom Dunn standing there and pushed him out of the way, which allowed, I think it was a scrum half to come through and score. That try was rightly disallowed. And I think well done Tom Dunn for making a big fuss about it because, it, you know, those ones are easily missed. And I think the fact that he kind of flared up brought it to everyone's attention. Then another cracking bit of front five play as Bath took a line out, kind of did a fake drive, exited, but nobody against Charlie Yules, who was the catcher. He went charging through and then from out of absolute nowhere, Ben Spencer appeared on his shoulder, dabbed down in the corner for 14 nil, And that was half time. Bath you know, well ahead on the scoreboard at this point. But early in the second half, Ollie Woodburn dived over in the corner for 7-14, and it looked like game on. Could Chiefs now sort of push on and get back into this game? Well, it didn't last all that long because a Jomo kicked through. There was a Cairns error. He tried to pick the ball up. It bobbled right at the last moment, which left the Jomo to just pick up and dot down for 19 points to 7. And then very soon after, Ollie Lawrence hit the line from a line-out like only he can really. There's just something about the way he carries the ball like that. It's just so, so direct. Uh, and that led to Reed, the blindside flanker, uh, coming off the bench to drive over 26-7. And that was really getting over. Stu Townsend got one back with 10 minutes to go, but it was too little, too late. I thought Chiefs might sneak this one. Um, I thought they needed it more. But Rob Baxter has been speaking a lot recently about how it's very difficult to, to win two, te- two games against the same team in close succession. Just mentally, it's a very tough thing to do, and that proved the case here. Bath cementing their spot in second in the table, and Chiefs, it looks like they're probably very a long call now for a semi-final place. Okay, on to Sunday, and we have Bristol versus Newcastle. I can't remember exactly the words I said, but I think 
running a mock or running wild or something like that was what I described Bristol as might being able to do because this Newcastle team haven't won a game all season and they had a much weak inside as well. And that was 100% the case with Bristol, yeah, just scoring a ton of points in the first half. I mentioned the front row being very dynamic. Genge with his handling, put Malin through on a beautiful unders line. And then literally a minute later, Carl Sinclair decided to try and outdo him through a massive mispass, which Radwan intercepted, scoring Newcastle's only points of the half, which made me jump. Newcastle were really falling off a lot of tackles, and that allowed Genge to step through and then literally sidestep the fullback for Bristol's sixth try out of seven in the first half, and an absolute spanking at that stage. Uh, Harry Randall in the middle of all of his play. I'm not sure whether it's he's well suited to how Bristol play or Bristol play that way because of the way he likes to play, but he's absolutely in the middle of all of it. And it was him who got the eighth try shortly after the break. Uh, but New- Newcastle also got another try, and this was another intercept, this time from uh, Malins uh, to Brett Common, who scorched over, looking uh, not all that pacey, to be honest. And uh, it was described as being... Um, the Harlem Globetrotters of, of rugby, Bristol. And there were a lot of basketball passes. There was a bit of juggling going, going on. And to heap the misery uh, in terms of the scoreboard, they were even kicking the touchline con- conversions. In the entire game, Bristol, uh, in open play, only kicked the ball four times. They literally went out to run Newcastle off their feet, and they did it. I predicted theirs by a lot. I was thinking 50 plus not the 87-14 scoreline that resulted. This is uh, a complete walkover. Now, a couple of things from Bristol social media this week that I really enjoyed. They've been training in the uh, in the grassroots club kit from the Bristol area, which is just a really nice touch and a great way of trying to integrate with your local community clubs. That was nice to see. Also on the socials this week, Max Lahith re-signed, I think, for just another year, but the, uh, the video they put out with that is suitably special, suitably max. So go and check that one out if you haven't already. Now then, final game of the weekend. And we have Sale, who are eighth against Harlequins in fourth. Sale got off to a great start. They were moving the ball effortlessly, really finding space. And Queens were just, you know, you only have to be 1% off to really struggle. And they fell off a couple of tackles. Sale kept moving the ball, and before long, it was 15-0, and it was really looking ominous. Like, Queens hadn't got a foothold in the game. They hadn't really affected anything. No big hits in defence. They hadn't had any attacking ball whatsoever. But then a couple of silly penalties, really, from Sale got Quinns in the game, and they scored two tries, but importantly, neither of which were converted. Both very sort of kickable conversions, uh, but not taken. Then the game went into a real... Uh, Squad of like box kick battle. None of the box kicks going that long or being that effective. It was a bit of a weird part of the game. It seemed like after that initial bout of like four tries, both teams just wanted to not be in their own half. Quinns did get the better of that uh, that box kick battle uh, with early, uh, with Murley, excuse me, Caden Murley winning a few balls in the air. But Sale Help got a foothold towards the end of the half and Reed went over in the corner for 22 10 at half time. And the scoreline that I really think, yeah, I think that reflected the half. Sale were definitely the better side. Early in the second half, and there was a lovely moment, as Joe Marler absolutely nailed somebody in a tackle. But the ball got turned over. And it was almost like Bevan Ruud was like, that's my England uh, challenger there, or who I want to try and take the England shirt off. So he nailed somebody within about 60 seconds himself. Two very similar tackles. I enjoyed that. That was nice. Sale knocked over a penalty, but then Quinns absolutely racing back into the game now and scored two tries from Murley and Oscar Beard, which left it 25-24. Danny Kerr was on the pitch at this stage. He really lifted the tempo and the accuracy, and some of his passing was outstanding. But another sub, Tom O'Flaherty, came on the pitch, and from that very kickoff, charged down an Esther Hazen kick. The ball just kind of somehow span around Missed four or five Quinns players and landed right in front of Rafi Quirk, another sub on the pitch, who scored for the bonus point of 32-24. And very soon afterwards, what I think was probably the moment of the match, 
After a turnover, Rob the Prayer got a big pass from uh, Ford, I think it was, and he had a person on his shoulder, he had another person wide, and another person wide, and he fizzed it, absolutely fizzed it to Aaron Reed, who scored beautifully in the corner. 37-24, and that really felt like it was the game. George Ford attempted a drop goal after that, only a 13 points difference, and I could see his thinking, he scuffed it and it went wide. But getting more than two scores away from Queens is absolutely vital towards the end of a game. And it proved to be the case because Queens went the length of the pitch, really outpacing a flatty, and then stopping the start to go around forward, putting Luke North Northmore under the sticks, 37 31. Quinn's got the ball back from the kickoff and they had it for a long, long time. They also made some breaks. They got further up the pitch. They kept it for two or three minutes, and it was a, it was touch and go. One clean break, one proper break, and they might well have been through for a win. But Sharks got the turnover. They win the game with a bonus point, and that puts them, that gives them a chance now to get semi-final qualification. Quins with two bonus points, though. Very important, because that kicks them above Sharks in the table. Whew. So that's week 15 in the books. And... I mean, if Quinns had won that at the end there, that would have been Sharks gone, I'm sure. And that would have been Quinns very much solidly in the semi-final prediction. However, first, second, third, and Saints, Bar, Saris all win. They all keep their places there. Quinns swap places with the absolutely resurgent Bristol Bears. Five wins out of the last five in the league. A ton of points. Their points difference now is equivalent to one extra league point, essentially, if they're tied with somebody else because they're scoring so many. Sale, the big winners this week. They jumped two to go above Chiefs and Tigers, who are probably, it's probably going to take a miracle for those two now to make it into the semi final. What do you think? I mean, it was a decent weekend of Premiership rugby. What you really want to see is, is real contests in every single one of the games. I think we got it in three of the games. Sadly, Saracens, Gloucester, and Bristol, Newcastle weren't really contests, but there was some awesome rugby played in that as well. So, a very good week for the Premiership. Moving towards a conclusion now, what do you think? Um, any kind of performances that I've missed that you think were really vital? Do you think any of the teams underperformed or overperformed? Let me know in the comments down below and I'll join you there for a conversation. And I will be back with you next week when it's going to be week 16 and we're coming to a real conclusion now of the Premiership season. So you can subscribe there, you can watch that one next and do not forget to get out of it.